how to walk. This is where we are. How to walk. I want to use as my base scripture this morning, Deuteronomy 5. I'm going to need you to keep your Bibles open. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, verse 32. And before I get started, just so I can get myself together, my mind, because this praise and worship has just been so incredible. Charlotte, would you come and pray for us as we get ready for the word? Father, we give you the glory and praise for our all the things that you are doing in our lives. We thank you for this church. I thank you for everyone here today. And we thank you especially for the word. The Bible says the entrance of your word brings light. Lord, enlighten us today. Lord, we know that at a flicker of light, every power of darkness will disappear. And Father, I pray that this word will set men free. This word will bring deliverance. This word will bring enlightenment. We give you all the glory. Open our hearts to receive this word as it comes. Let us never be the same. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You're at Deuteronomy? Okay. Somewhat of an obscure book. But it's very, very powerful. Let me give you just a little background of Deuteronomy that's just going to add some punch, I think, to our time together. Duo means what? Two. Deuteros then means second. Afterwards or secondly. Everybody say Deuteros. Means what? It means second. Then Deuteronomy means the second law. The giving of the second law. The giving of the second law. So the first law was given to the old generation before they entered into the wilderness for 40 years. Then the second law was given by Moses to the new generation as they were coming out of the wilderness into God's promised land. That's the second law. You need to know this. Deuteronomy is basically broken into three parts. Chapters one through four is that of review. It's the reviewing of what? The children of Israel coming out of Egypt being redeemed by the hand of God. But what's interesting is they reject the land that God promised them through the covenant of Abraham. Then you have chapters 6 through 25. No, you have chapters 5 through 25 that speak of the present it now focuses on God's loving kindness his goodness and then from there through 37 you get a glimpse into the future 
of what the Israelites are supposed to do. And what are they supposed to do? They are to conquer the Canaanites in their land. And they are to abide by the conditions that God gives to them to obtain and maintain the land. They are to live separate lives, unique, unique lives in God. The key in the book of Deuteronomy is obedience. Obedience. That's the key there is obedience. God wants his children to be obedient. Now, let me give you some scriptures around that. And that word just keeps coming up of obedience. Let's look at Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. You're no doubt familiar with this. Let's read it together. Hear, O Israel. And the next verse. Okay, now let's go to same book, 11, 11 and 8. Let's read it together. Therefore, okay. 10 and 12. You got it? Let's read it together. And do what? Okay. And in verse 14 says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God. Also, what? Okay, now let's go back to verse 12. Let's read that again, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord? Now, it's strange, it seems strange of a commandment to love God. But in the Hebrew, we learn that love is not exclusive. It's not confined to your feelings. It has to do with your intellect. It's centered in your senses. And so God wants you to choose to love him with your whole heart. And the soul here is synonymous to the heart. And with all your strength gives the idea that God wants everything that you have. He wants it all. He wants it all. Now, does he deserve it all? Because all that you have belongs to him. Amen. Y'all are here today. 
It all belongs to him. Now, the challenge, the challenge is doing this, following these commands. That's the challenge. Because as children of God, we're no different than the prodigal. We defy the parameters that the Father sets for us. And sometimes we get it in our mind that we know of a better way. And I can do this on my own. So we strike out <laughs> into a foreign country on our own only to discover that we need God. Amen. And by the way, that prodigal got up. He went back home. And God, what, welcomed him back home. Which makes me think of, again, the meaning of Deuteronomy 2. The second chanceness of God. That even when we go astray, God in his grace gives us another chance. Amen. Amen. Not only are we like the prodigal who gets it in his mind, I don't like all of these restraints. Is it we're like the one who stays at home but still wants to conform to the ways of the world. So you can be in the body of Christ, sitting up in church every weekend, but not following the principles of God, but following the principles of the world. We can be like the barn building fool, where God allows us to prosper so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. Instead, we hoard things up. We do things our own way. We follow the principles of the world rather than the principles of God. Only to discover that God can empty out your barn in one night. Amen. So obedience at the root of it you know what? At the root of it, you get a chance to show that you're grateful. Grateful that there is a God. Grateful that he thinks enough of you to bless you as he has blessed you. Is anybody grateful today? So this word, uh, this book, Deuteronomy, is, is so, man, it's so powerful. Do you know it's the book that Jesus used to fight against Satan? Mm hmm Yeah. When he was taken up to a high mountain after his baptism, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, just as the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And then the devil comes to him, and the words that Jesus speak comes out of Deuteronomy. Amen. Some of you are being challenged by the enemy. And as Charlotte prayed, I pray right now that yokes are broken and destroyed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And that you come to your rightful place in God. Hallelujah. Amen. Because God's got something powerful for you. 
Amen. I'm excited right here. Amen. So the word never goes out of style. It's never old. It's, it's never old. Never, never old. Um, a young lady asked me a few years ago, why do you preach so much from the Old Testament? And that wasn't her real question and concern. The sermon says, how come you don't swing the limb and holler when you preach? Because I've learned the word has power by itself. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen the engineer of a train standing behind the train, pushing the train down the track? He pulls the lever, and the train has power to move on down the track. God all only requires of me that I flip the switch of the Holy Ghost, and the train just moves on down the track, and it has power. Amen. And I just get on board with you all. And we go for a ride in the Holy Ghost. Amen. How many of you know that there's power in the word of God? <laughs> okay. So, let's go to that passage that we were to start with, 5 and 32. Therefore, you shall be careful, circle careful, mindful, thoughtful, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. Um, notice this next line. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. Remember those are the same words that he gave to Joshua when Joshua was afraid of moving on after Moses. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left. And give me the next verse. Hold on to your seats. You shall do what? In what? In all the ways. Stop right there. You're going to do what? You're going to do what? Yesterday it was so funny in here. It was a young man. Um present that I prophesied to um, some six years ago. He said, it was right over there. I said to him, God is going to use you to do great things. You're going to speak the word. And he said, for years, he hated me for that. There were some things going on in his life. I didn't know it. And he was mad at God, I think, ready to turn away from God. And then here I come saying, God is going to use you when nothing in his life was going right. I gave that boy the microphone yesterday, and he couldn't stop talking. <laughs> Just a well, a well. And he 
had to learn. And when God says something, you can try to turn left and right. But God's going to pull you back and work on you until you walk. Are you listening to me? You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you. Stop right there. That you may what? Is that what it says? That you may exist. That you may what? That you may live. <sighs> Alive in Hebrew is Cain. C-H-A-Y-I-M. C-H-A-Y-I-M. Cain. The root Kai. Alive. M-I-M. I-M is if. Basically meaning the conditions of our being alive is connected to being in God. He is Elohim Cain, the living God. C-H-A-Y-I-M. Elohim Cain, he is the living, the living God. Everybody say the living God. Cain is also in the plural, meaning that you're not to live your life alone. It was meant for you to live your life in Jesus Christ. And as you live your life in Jesus Christ, your life does not decrease. It does not diminish because the love of God increases, it multiplies. So as you, as you grow older, daughter, and you share the love of Jesus Christ, your life is multiplying. Let me put it another way for you. It's, it's plural because... There's a universe inside of you. When Cain killed his brother Abel, the scripture says in the original version that your brother's bloods, plural, is calling out, is crying out from the earth. Your brother's descendants are crying out from the earth. So there's something, it's not just you, but there's the plurality of the Lord inside of you, descendants inside of you, which is the reason why in this particular book, Moses speaks of generations and generations and generations. Powerful, powerful. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord God, God has commanded you that you may do what? Live. Everybody say live. live. That I'm alive to God. I'm not just existing, but I'm alive to the presence of God. Is anybody alive here today? Maybe I need to ask it this. Do you know that God is alive? Yeah. Let me ask again. 
Do you know that God is alive? In case you don't know, in case you need some evidence, I want to tell you that God is still a miracle-working God. You know this. Now, y'all are getting here. You're kind of waking up now. But just in case somebody needs to know, and I never thought the day would come when I, I would do this. This cane belonged to Debbie's mama. And last week, she got healed. Her legs got healed. And she didn't come to pick it up. <laughs> it's been here all week. I've got another cane in my office belonging to another member of the church. And you know what? They didn't come to pick it up. And yesterday, she was picking up her feet like never before and walking around to get the communion. Can you praise the Lord in this place? Be a witness to five people and tell them, my God is still alive. There was a woman who had not been to church for two months because she couldn't take 10 steps without being out of breath. You should have saw her coming around yesterday to receive the Lord's Supper. A new lease on life. My God is still alive. Hallelujah. There's Debbie in the back. She too came down the aisle like never before. My God is still alive. Now, I don't know what he's done for you, but I want to tell you that he's still a miracle working God, and I want to be alive and active in him. Come on, give God glory here. I said, my office is starting to look like a section of Walgreens. <laughs> Wheelchairs and canes. <laughs> okay, Pastor, tell me more how I'm alive. Let's go to Ephesians 2. We get to stump on the devil's head today with the truth. Ephesians 2 and 4. God, who is rich in mercy, morning by morning, new mercy I see, hallelujah, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. made us <laughs> made us what? 
Stop, stop, stop. Now, we need to slow this down. He made us what? And he already said, even when you were dead in your trespasses, he loved you. When you were dead in Adam, numb to the things of God, then God made you alive. And connected you to Jesus Christ. I want you to get that picture. There's not death that's connected to Jesus. But there's new life. Connected to who? Jesus. Give me the next verse. Are y'all okay? Now, get this. He connected you with Jesus Christ and raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I need to give you more word. Go to the next book, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. When Jesus went to the cross, went through suffering and pain, his last word, he says, it's finished. He accomplished things. He brought it to an end. The debt that I owed, Claude, he paid it in full. Hallelujah. 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 He said, it's finished. Our high priest says, it's finished. Now, in Hebrews, the other high priest would go into the temple uh, and they had to keep on working. As a matter of fact, in all of the furniture that's in the temple, there's no, there's no chair. There's no place to sit down, implying that the work for them was continual. But for Jesus Christ, a high priest, when he said it's finished, guess what? He went to heaven and sat down. And rested, saying, it's done. And now, so now Daryl comes along, and Daryl gets a chance to walk in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And where Daryl gets the sense, well, you know, I got to work, I got to do, God says, Jesus said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You just come in and sit down here with me because it's, it's already done. I've been triumphant, Daryl. Sit down here with me. What well, demons are after me, let me show you something. When you call my name, they bow down to me. <laughs> hey! <laughs> All authority, darkness, powers, principalities, are beneath my feet. Can you say Satan is under my feet? 
Why? Because you're seated at the right hand of the... Are you getting this now? Can you praise God in this place for who you are? Whose you are? <laughs> Go back to the Deuteronomy text. You know what? I got to hurry along. The enemy doesn't want you to know who you are. Before we go there, give me Colossians 3 and 3. Yeah. He doesn't want you to know who you are. God. He doesn't want you to understand your position. Because if you understand your position, then you understand your privileges. Are y'all, you listening to me? You understand your privileges, then you understand the possessions that you have. So he's got to keep you blinded. Okay, now here. I'm not going to finish. Okay, so for you died... Can you say, I died? I died? The old man is dead. I died, and my life is what? Hidden with Christ. Ooh. The old man is dead. My life is now what? Come on, say it. Is what? Hidden. George, on the way into the sanctuary, he said, Man, yesterday I thought about that word. He's like the Berean Christians. He went in deeper. He said that hidden means concealed. He said when you're hiding it's like you're waiting to be found. But when you're concealed, the idea is God has you in a place yeah. Yeah. where you can't be found. Yeah. yeah. You in that's right, you're in the shelter of the Almighty. And so you're under divine lock and key. He puts the bolts around you, Amen. put angels around you. <laughs> oh, Lord. And he said, George said this, and that's the reason why, Pastor, Satan is roaming, seeking whom he may devour. You know what? And he can roam and roam and roam and roam and roam. Can't find you. And when he gets a scent of where you are, God taunts him and says, he's over here. But you can't touch him. And even if you get your hands on him, he's still hidden in me. Hallelujah. It's shouting time. Can you say I'm hidden in Christ? Is that all right? Is that all right? <laughs> I ask, is that all right? So storms may come. It's all right. I'm hidden in Christ. Now, let me go to some base scripture, and I got I to gotta wrap up. This, this is, go back to Deuteronomy. Yeah. 
Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. I don't know who you are. If you've been running from God, today run to God. Walk in all his ways, which the Lord God has commanded you, that you may do what? Look at your neighbor and say, live. When you're active, Brother McCowan, you know this, and when you're alive to God, to the presence and power of God, nothing can harm you. And whatever comes... I like the next part of this. It says that it may be well with you. People get troubled when they're trying to live life without the Lord. Storms come. They fall apart. But isn't it amazing that when you been joined together with Jesus. You're hidden with him. Things come on. And you have peace. Because life and peace. I said I was going to finish, didn't I? Life and peace are tied to God. Life comes through God. Okay, let me stop. Everybody stand. <laughs> I've realized, Pastor Pythas. And sometimes I want to go my own way. But you, you said to walk with him that I may live. And I, I want to be active to the power of God. Yeah, you do. That it may be well with you. And when you move in those things, those commands of God, there's a godly promise, and all of that's in Deuteronomy, that you'll be blessed in the city. That's in that book. Blessed in the field. Blessed in your coming and your going. But you've probably experienced this as well. When you go your own way, when you're disobedient, there's a godly promise on that too. It ain't good. I want my family to be blessed. I want to honor God. That you're talking about, that thing about it being well with your soul, I want that. That peace that you're talking about, yeah. It's not just a hello and goodbye. It speaks of prosperity. I want that. To be alive. To experience the abundant life. To be alive. And God wants you to have that. And if you're ready to walk in that and receive that, come on and meet me at the altar today.